What's up, guys? My name is Song Join, and I will be playing Como Debi, which is a song from my latest album. Hope you like it. Let's just pray the sunrise sleeps through the night, so we don't have to wake up and say goodbye. We both know that this is my voice, so I look at you. Come on, baby. Take it in at this moment. Don't care if it's right. Don't care if it's wrong. For mad if you don't stay, it's your core. All I'm asking from you is to make up your mind. But baby, just for the night, it's alright. I, I try and I try, but you are the one I can't deny. You hit all my heart in the side. Let's just pray. To wake up and say goodbye, we both know that this is above all time. So I look at you, come on, baby. When this win, take control of the race coming through. You don't have to choose the music to. My conviction is no time to lose. And I try and I try, but you are the one I can't deny. You have all my heart inside. Let's just pray the sunrise sleeps the Thank you. Hi, you're with us in Music Lab, where we invite music acts to our studio. I'm Adino Abdul Hadi, and I've got Hong Join here with me. Hong Join is a rising Singaporean singer-songwriter who is based in the US. He's back in Singapore to play a couple of shows and to promote his new album Komo Rebi. Hi, Hong Join. Welcome、Hello. to Music Lab. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm very excited to be on Straits Times. <laughs> very happy to have you here. <laughs> Thank you. So, I understand that you are born in Singapore. You grew up here, but right now you live in the US, Boston. How did you end up there? 
So I'm actually there for studies. So I'm there in university right now. And while I pursue my education in the States, um, I'm also doing all I can to, you know, do music and grow as an artist and play shows, gain experience. And hopefully one day, once I'm done with my studies, I can, you know, pursue this whole artist thing as a real full-time career. Yeah. All right. So we're curious, what's it like to be a Singaporean musician uh, in the US right now? What's a, is there a routine? What's a, a day like for you? What's a week like for you? That's a very interesting question. Um, I don't think necessarily being a Singaporean makes me very different from, you know, most people there. I mean, I'm definitely an international student and someone who's like a foreigner in, mm. in the US. But um, I think mainly the Asian community in, in, in the States is very strong. And I am very much a part of, you know, their API and Asian communities. Mm. And they are very, I've met many supportive people and creative minds that are also Asian identifying and I think we all grow together and we all try our best to you know contribute to the art scene and grow as an artist or as a creator and whatnot so yeah I think being a Singaporean in the States is a unique thing not many Singaporeans are there but um, I do feel proud still and at every show that I play I'm always like are there any Singaporeans in the crowd? Mm. And I'm like, I'm Singaporean and I try my best to, you know, represent Singapore as well as I can when I'm there in the States because I'm very much trying to, you know, assimilate to their culture. Mm. But I'm also trying to be a proud Singaporean. So I guess a balance of those two makes me quite a unique, I, I mean, have a pretty unique experience in the States, I would say, but yeah fun open open to a lot of new horizons and i'm experiencing a lot of new things but i think it's been very it's been very beneficial to my growth as both an individual and as a as an artist right yeah how often do you play shows down there very often i would say because i think in the u.s mm. there's a lot of shows that are always happening so i play small shows and I play big shows like festivals um, but I would say maybe once a month or maybe a bit more than that but the big shows that you know really matter and have a lot of audiences and festivals and stuff like that college shows mm. um, I would say at least twice every three months ish but I try to balance that with all my studies and right. it gets tough but um yeah, I think it's all about balancing and finding enough time to do everything and make sure I don't fail my studies. Right. right. Are these all yeah. in Boston or, or do you do? Um, actually, I don't. I don't actually play in Boston that much. Um, because okay. it's a very college demographic mm -hmm. in in Boston. But when I do play, um, I usually travel to New York or oh, okay. get flown around mm. to different colleges to you know play at play at the shows, play at the events and yeah, um mainly New York, I would say. It's it's where it's where dreams are made of yeah. and, and yeah. I I love Boston, but I think it's a very more it's very much a college city in mm. Boston, so there's not much, you know, shows that are suitable for me, I guess, but yeah, still a cool place that I have that I'm that I'm living in and mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. all my friends are at, so Okay, yeah. right. Twenty twenty three was a big year for you. Spotify featured you as uh, one of its radar artists, mm -hmm. which highlights up and coming artists from around the world. What kind of impact did that have on your on your music career? Twenty twenty three was a was a crazy year for mm. me. Um, I think the Spotify radar thing actually changed my life. Um, so shout out to Believe, who I am signed with as a part of a distribution deal. Right. Um, Drosel, who is the label manager, she pitched me to be a Spotify radar artist. And just a few months before that, I think I signed with Believe and um, I had 
intentions to try to be a Spotify radar artist. So I made it clear that that was my intention. Mm -hmm. And very quickly, you know, I worked with uh, my team to, you know, pitch my artists, plans and stuff like that. And at that point in time, 2023, it was Fool, which was my EP. Um, and we pitched that as part of the radar program and it got accepted. And, you know, I just got a lot of support from Spotify editorial. So if you see me on like mm -hmm. Rising 65 yeah. and New Music Fridays, and it's a lot of it is, you know, with the help of Spotify and Belief. And yeah, I think for me, it allowed me to just, you know, focus on creating music and have other people work together with me to, you know, market the music, distribute the music. And with that, I could just completely focus on what I wanted to create. And I'm pretty proud of Fu mm. to this day. And um, I would say that that EP is a, the one that really helped me find my sound as an artist and as a live performer. And in a lot of my shows, like, the songs from Fool are going to be always a part of the set list. And we've taken these songs to many places. And it's been a big part of many people's lives whenever I play live. And, you know, after the show, they come mm. to me and like, oh, like, I love this song and it helped me through some dark times. And these are the things that keep me going. But yeah, the Radar program... I mean, even till now, they're still Spotify still supports me a lot, and um, I owe a lot of my listening base to them, getting discovered. And I think the the new age of music mm. is streaming, mm. so we have to like make use of it and use it to our advantage instead of you know pushing it away because it used to be vinyls and CDs and yeah. stuff. And now, um, as a Gen Z myself, I think we have to embrace the new era of music and I like to think that I did and it has made life a lot easier and given me this platform to, mm. you know, share my music and yeah, I'm on Straits Times now, <laughs> <laughs> which is which is always great and interesting. Um, but yeah, um, shout out Spotify. Yeah. Yeah. And you just did two big shows here in Singapore. Mm -hmm. The first will be an opening set for American indie singer Rinky Montgomery at Pasir Panjang Power Station. What was that like for you? It's crazy. I think it was the biggest show I've ever played. Um, How many people were there in the audience? It was like close to 2,000, mm -hmm. I think. Um, it was at Pasar Panjang Power Station. Power Station. And at that point in time, I had just came back. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it was like a week. So we had to practice with my band. And then I was still like not very used to, you know, it's always like a reverse culture shock, mm -hmm. you know, coming back. And then everyone is Singaporean and just me being Singaporean, I just want to put on a good show mm -hmm. and, you know, show that, you know, all of this time, I, I, I what I'm doing is real. And um, I think it was a great show. <laughs> I had a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. And Ricky is a great, great guy. You know, someone who is as famous as he is, mm -hmm. you know, he's just a very humble guy. And I aspire to be like that, you know, be humble and you know, off and on stage, he is very different and he's just just like us. And I think me playing that show helped me a lot. So shout out to the organizers for, you know, getting me on that stage. And yeah, I feel, I feel like being on that stage just reminded me why I make music. And, you know, it's not just about making music in my bedroom and, you know, releasing them on Spotify, Apple Music, stuff like that. And it's really about translating that into a live context. And, you know, it just always feels good to have people scream the songs back at you. And mm. that's why I love music. And I, th I think that's why a lot of people do music and want to do music because mm. it's just a very... Like, I wouldn't trade it for anything else. Um, the feeling of making music and knowing that someone's listening to them and enjoying it, it's an experience that I wouldn't give up for anything else. Right. Yeah. And the second show is even more significant because it's crazy. a solo show and yeah. I heard you sold out all the yeah, tickets to crazy. that show, The Esplanade. I'm still, I'm still like <laughs> trying to process it, you know. It just happened a few days ago. 
on a Sunday. Mm -hmm. So my Monday just basically did not exist because mm. I was out the whole day, um, sleeping and trying to recover. But yeah. Um, I've seen the videos. The yeah. fans were all singing crazy. along. It's crazy. Yeah, they were really into it. Yeah, it's been, it's been a long journey, I think. So I've played a headline show mm -hmm. every year since 20... Uh, every year, but 2021, 2022, and now 2023. Um, I didn't actually mean to, you know, play a show uh, this year because I didn't think I was going to come back until mm -hmm. the Ricky show happened. And I was like, I have to come back. And since I was playing that show, I, I just thought, why not just play a headline show and do something for the fans? And yeah, um, I didn't expect to, you know, actually fill up the venue, mm -hmm. Esplanade Annex, crazy venue. I mean, a lot of planning was involved. Um, I, I don't know, I've been working so hard to make this possible because no label, no nothing yet, yeah. uh, no... As an indie artist. I'm still very much mm. a growing uh, independent musician. Mm. A lot to grow, a lot to learn. And um, I just wanted to, you know, test myself and see if I can do all these things. And most importantly, meet the fans. Because it's rare for me to, you know, come back. And when I do, it's maybe once a year. Mm. And I love my audiences a lot. And I always use just use this opportunity to, you know, give something back to the fans even if it's not like uh i'm not gonna like okay it's just gonna be very there's a lot of work involved in in organizing an independently run show yeah and um at the end of the day it's worth it and the audiences enjoyed it and i got to live my dream so hopefully a lot more in the future and uh i'll keep going this you know every show rejuvenates me yeah so playing in front of a home crowd is always a different experience because these are your people mm -hmm. and uh, i mean in the states it's it's also rejuvenating and it feels good to you know play in front of people uh and the thing that's always different about a Singapore show is that I started off in Singapore. Yeah. So I always will be Singaporean no matter how long I spend in the States. Uh, and it's, it's things like these that, you know, remind me that this is home. Mm -hmm. And these are the people that have been supporting me and they are the ones that gave me a platform in the first place, you know, to pursue music. And yeah, so I always owe it to the fans and the audiences and... Yeah, hopefully more shows in the future. But yeah, that's how I feel about my headline show. But a lot more to process still. <laughs> but yeah, that's it for me for now. Hopefully in the future we get to do a lot more. Okay. Yeah. And you just performed for us Komo Rebi, the title track from your new album. Now I understand it's a Japanese word that roughly means sunlight through the trees. Yeah, How close. Does, does that, <laughs> close. Close. How does close, that relate close. to the songs on the album? So komorebi is actually um, a Japanese word that does not have like a direct right. English translation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, my grandparents are Japanese, ah, okay. um, and uh, so my mom's also Taiwanese. And, oh, and your I, dad is Japanese? no, my dad is completely Singaporean. Okay, but um, you I speak Japanese. I used to, mm. and then I forgot. <laughs> okay. Uh, I got to work on my Chinese mm. first. But um, yeah, so Komorebi is, uh, like I said, it's sunlight filtering through leaves. Mm. And uh, to me, it's a very special word uh, because my favorite person loves it. She is the one who made me want to, you know, make a whole album about it. And I just think it's me also reconnecting with my Japanese roots. Mm -hmm. And it's just an interesting word to me because there is no English translation. And hence, I tried to use music to, you know, express the, the, the emotions and the meaning of the word. And what better way than through song? Because that's the only way that I know how to express myself. So yeah, I made a whole album out of this song. I mean, all of the words, sorry. Mm. And yeah, I think it's one of my favorite works that I've done because it's the most coherent. And I took a year to, you know, finish up the songs, produce them and make sure they all flow. And yeah, it's 
it's a big part of my life. As with every album, every EP, it's always a reflection of um, what I'm going through and how I feel at a certain point in time. So this is what I felt the past year. Mm-hmm. And yeah, just gonna keep playing these songs and promoting it, playing live and see where this album takes me. But yeah, that's Como <laughs> Debi. All right. How did you start out making music? Was it something that you've always been doing since you were a child? Oof. You're 22 right now. I am right? 22. Hmm. Um, so, I I didn't grow up uh, in a very musical family. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've I've loved listening to music, but I've never actually considered music as a career path. You know, because the typical you know conventional way is you just go through school and then go to university and then get a job, mm-hmm. and that was the path that I thought I was gonna take. Um, Until COVID hit, ah. and I decided to, you know, I mean, what else did we do during COVID? But you know, scroll TikTok and 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 stuff. So, me well, being me point, during COVID, were you? I was in I was in the military still. Oh, you were in NS. So okay. every mm. single moment that I booked out mm. uh, from camp, uh, I just stayed in my room because we couldn't go out. Yeah, and I learned how to produce via YouTube, ah. <laughs> and. Uh, at the same time, I was just writing songs, you know. And before that, you were not doing before music that, at all. Before that, I was. I never. I think I did take piano lessons, but my main instrument now is the guitar, self-taught. Mm. Uh, I think the first guitar I had was my dad. Uh, like, he had like a classical guitar. Okay. And then I just tried playing some chords on mm. it, and um, yeah, that was like when I was 16. I picked up the guitar when I was 16, and yeah, I just played. Every single time that I was free, and more so in the military when you know, military, and then COVID because uh-huh. five days you're yeah. in camp and then you book out and then you can't go out. Yeah. So I just, I just be in my room making music. So and that was the first time you started making your own music. Yeah, straight up just writing songs with my mm-hmm. guitar, and using Logic Pro. Yeah, a bit more behind, a, a bit more uh, earlier was maybe Garage Band. Yeah. And then upgrades, and then I, I got too deep into it to you know stop doing it all of a sudden, and then that was when I was also just posting YouTube covers, mm-hmm. and then my friends from military taught me how to you know edit TikTok videos, right. like you know the the captions and all that, and then they just pushed me to you know put out my first TikTok, and yeah. Just, Things picked up and people liked the covers that I was posting at the point in time, and but at that point I I had a lot of songs that I wrote, yeah, but never had the confidence you know to just put them out, but yeah, eventually I just put my first song the last time out, mm. and it was meant for me, only and my, my friends who I was close to at a point in time it was twenty twenty. 2021, towards the end of the year, and uh, I put it through DistroKid, and you know, you know how it goes. Like you heartbroken, and then just put out a song, and that's mm-hmm. how every artist's right. career starts, okay. you know. And yeah, I, I just liked it. I liked doing music. I thought I had something going on, so I just kept doing it. Put singles out, and. Um, People liked it also, and it was not just my friends anymore. It was people I didn't even know, strangers on the internet, and just doing music and having music mm-hmm. um, allowed me to, you know, meet very cool people. And eventually, once I was done with the military, I had a couple songs out, and I was interested to, you know, learn more about this. Music thing in Singapore, and I interned at a local record label. And then, oh, which which label was this? Uh, it's called Where the Fruits. Oh, Where the Fruits. It's an okay. indie label, mm-hmm. and um, event. That's where I met a lot of a lot of artists and people in the scene. And then I did that, and at the same time, I just kept doing music on my own independently. Mm-hmm. And I had the chance to you know study in the U.S. and So half of my degree is like a music mm. degree, right. and I actually didn't 
tell my parents what I was doing. I just applied for it because I didn't, I didn't actually think I was gonna get it, but I did. And then that's where the whole conversation started with my yeah. parents. And then mm-hmm. um, eventually, I played some shows and left home because my parents were convinced that this is what I wanted to do because mm. I already loved it. And once I started this whole music thing, I was obsessed mm. and I knew that it was what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And that has not changed, obviously. <laughs> and yeah, um, just kept going. I still don't know what I'm doing, mm. honestly, um, but I'm just taking it one step at a time. And I'm still young, um, just figuring out things. Um, but I have the support of many, many people, uh, my friends, mm. my family, and the friends that I've made just from doing music. They're so supportive and like not just back home but in the states and yeah i i think i've very i'm very privileged mm-hmm. to you know have this opportunity and i want to you know make the most out of this situation that i'm in and yeah i'm just gonna keep doing what i'm doing and helping people along the way whoever i can help mm-hmm. and yeah hopefully one day i can contribute in the same way that people inspired me to do this, I can inspire the next generation of young artists and stuff like that. But I'm still 22, so who knows? Long way ahead. But I hope, you know, that in the future, uh, I can do music as a full-time job okay. in Singapore. That's the, that's, the, that's the goal. Right. Who are your listeners? When you look at your listenership data, um, like where, where are they from? A few places. So Indonesia, mm-hmm. definitely big, big country. They love music. They eat up sad songs. Right. Philippines, uh, the States, because I'm based in the States. Mm. And Singapore, shout out Singapore. Um, but yeah, mainly these four countries and definitely a few more here and there uh, around the world. But definitely at this point, I would say it's pretty, there has to be at least someone in every country that has Spotify, you know, mm. because of what Spotify has done for me yeah. in pushing out my music and with social media, it's just, it's crazy what it can do because mm. I had no connections to the industry, whatnot, and it was purely through TikTok and Instagram Reels and YouTube and all these things that, you know, it landed me in this place. Mm. And um, yeah, everywhere. And hopefully I get to go to these countries, you know, play play music also and bring my songs to different places and meet the fans and the audiences that you know have been supporting me and yeah that's the goal one day right so i understand you're going back to the states mm-hmm. soon i am in about a week or so a couple of weeks yeah and what's gonna happen what what are your plans after that um so i'm taking a break from school just doing music full time uh and yeah the goal is to you know keep touring and meet the people that I have linked up with online obviously um, a lot of things now are done through uh, like Instagram and stuff like that and I have a lot of creative people that I'm friends with but I've never met and hopefully I get to collaborate with them and make music with a lot more people and keep playing the album live um, playing it at shows and just growing as an artist I mean there's no like one path that each artist has to take but you know everything has to be planned calculated you know a lot of i think a lot of people think that being an artist is about luck and um you know just hoping for a viral moment but i don't think i've ever gone viral Mm -hmm. um it's just been consistent hard work and posting things even when you know you're not getting the traction that you want but there are always people that are loyal and supporting you and at this point i've done this music thing for three four years and Mm. i've built like a like a like a fan base or audience that i care a lot about and i feel very connected to them because i'm always replying to them i make it a point to reply almost every dm that i get and um that i think makes me very makes me feel very connected to my audience and I owe it to them to keep going no matter how hard it gets 
and also to my family and my friends who, you know, have expectations and hopes for me to keep going, make this thing work. And also for myself, I, lo I love music mm -hmm. and I want to, you know, make this my life. So I'm just going to keep going. I don't know where it's going to take me, but I'm going to keep working hard to achieve that. Yeah. Okay, Hong Joy, went down to our last question. Mm -hmm. This is something that we ask everyone who's who appeared on the show. Where do you see yourself in five to ten years? Ooh, well, the dream would be the dream playing music mm -hmm. and making music and making and a difference you? in where the world. Five to ten years. Yeah. Well, I want to settle down in Singapore. Mm. Um, so you're still, coming back. You plan to come I back? I do want to come back. Yeah. yeah. Um, but as of now, um, for the next few years finish up school and be an artist and be based in the States. But I mean, once I get kicked out <laughs> or uh, I lose my visa or, you know, I have commitments back at home mm. where I have to, you know, settle down and I want to be able to come back and still do music mm. in the same way that I'm doing it now. And um, yeah, and hopefully by then I would have there would be a new generation of artists and creatives and people who want to contribute to the music scene. And I want to be the person or one of the many people that um, inspire them and be like some form of guidance. Because for me, when I first started off music, I was 18, 19, actually maybe, okay, 19. Mm. And... Um, I think a lot of people don't think that music is a viable option, but the world is changing and um, a lot of things are not the same. The way businesses run, they're different now and the new generation of creatives will, you know, find a way to make it work. So a lot of people, they say local music, uh, I don't know, they have bad things to say about local music or pursuing an artistic career mm. back home. Uh, I'm lucky that I get to leave, but I don't think that it has to be like that for anyone. Um, and I really hope that, you know, I can be part of building and nurturing, like, you know, a community and a scene for the local music thing that we have because I learned a lot from the people older than me and I owe a lot of what I know and what I am now to them. So I want to be the same for people in the future who, you know, hopefully will also be confident and brave enough to pursue music in the same way that I did. It doesn't have to be the same way that I did, yeah. but, you know, who knows what the future is going to be like, but I want to be there to witness that and contribute to that. So yeah, 10 years, not a long time, not honestly. Long time. Yeah. But yeah, till then, I'll, I'll just keep making music and hopefully do some good in the world as an, as an artist. Yeah, that's my goal. All right. Hon yeah. it's been lovely to have you on the show. Thank, Thank you, you so very much. much. Hope to see you again back in Singapore soon. I will be back. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thanks for watching. And remember to like, subscribe and share. And don't forget to hit the bell icon.